This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Yeah, and right. thank you for joining us today. With me today is our co-hosts, John Cameron and Richard Fields. Gentlemen, today we have cancel culture pushback. There was a letter written to, on Harper's on Harper's Magazine with a signed by like 150 different people complaining about cancel culture, saying how cancel culture is toxic to the creative process. And they've received actually pushback. I think one guy has actually already gotten fired because he signed the letter and a couple of issued apologies. What do you guys think about this? You know, it, it, it hasn't been too long since I had to look up cancel culture because I didn't really know what it was. When I, when I looked it up, I found out it's basically anybody who doesn't agree with the speaker should shut up. Uh, it's basically the antithesis of free speech. It's, uh, if you don't agree with us, then you need to you know pack up your toys and go home because you're not worth listening to. Kind of like you on this show when Richard's really on one of his rants and we try to interject. No, kidding. Um, sort of. Yeah, no. It, what bothers me is that the the label liberal. I mean, I think the letter was was definitely the letter needed to be written. I'm very pleased that Harper post, Harper's posted that letter. I'm I'm very pleased uh, that that these quote unquote liberals and and I wish they wouldn't call themselves liberals because they are in uh, in no sense of the word except for some of these people might be what what we define as classic liberals who believe in freedom of speech and, you know, uh, risk and all the rest of that stuff. But, um, you know, when, when Barack Obama is warning people that, uh, that uh, people need uh, to have a voice and there has to be discourse even when you agree, we know that things have come awfully far in the wrong direction. So I think it, it was really an eye-opener and the idea that uh, uh, whoever shouts the loudest and has the biggest gun can silence uh, people who don't agree. I mean, we've, we've seen it in the scientific community with, uh, with climate change. Uh, if you don't agree with the, the, with the religion of cl uh, climate change or global warming, you can't get a paper published, you can't get a job, you can't get any kind of grants from anybody. Um, and, and, you know, for years, and that's been ignored, and now we're seeing it in popular culture with uh, statues being toppled. Many of them, of course, should be, and, and rebranding of sports teams. So um, this is huge. And, you know, that's, I think, why we have a constitution. A lot of libertarians aren't real fans of the constitution, but, but your inalienable right to pretty much say whatever you want and not be forced to say what you don't want is being trampled on uh, left and I was going to say left, but supposedly the the fascists on the right are the ones who are defending people's uh, you know ability to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, we are we are libertarians made up the word libertarian because we are in fact classical liberals. The the uh, term liberal was stolen by the progressives back in the, around the turn of the nineteenth century. Um, the thing that we need to remember and that everybody should remember is that the antidote to hate speech or bad speech or any kind of speech you don't like is more speech mm -hmm. to counter the bad or hateful speech, uh, to uh, pretend it doesn't exist or to silence it into, or to uh, quash it into silence is simply to, to uh, create a, a wound that will fester and, uh, and mushroom out in very, very non-speech friendly ways. Uh, you take, a, a, say, a Nazi that is prevented from speaking Speaking Nazi beliefs is counterable with obvious uh, counter arguments. Uh, putting a Nazi into the underground and letting him uh, only speak by actions, by blowing up bombs or churches or whatever, that is dangerous. So you don't want him to quash bad speech. You want to counter bad speech. Mm -hmm. Mold grows in the dark, right? It's the bad stuff grows in the dark. So you want to expose it to light. So you can actually deal with it because you can't deal with something you don't hear. And if you cancel speech and cancel viewpoints that you that you don't want to hear, well, then you can't deal with it. But also, if we think back in the history, it wasn't all that long ago where talking about gay rights could have gotten you fired. And look how far we've come because we've allowed speech. 
we don't actually know what kind of speech in the future is going to be needed, which is why we should concentrate on on free speech. Now, John brought up an interesting point about renaming uh, football teams. Washington Redskins, I think, announced this morning that they are changing, they are retiring the name Redskins are going to come up with a with a new name and logo and all that. It's one of those issues I don't particularly care about. So what do you guys have any opinions on this? I think it's a good example of the fact that the uh, private market, the free enterprise, forces uh, companies to uh, change with the times. It wasn't too long ago that the current owner of the Redskins said, no way over my dead body, I will never ever change the name of the football team from uh, Redskins to something else. It's a part of our legacy, yada, yada, yada. He did. The, uh, the force of public opinion, uh, his fans essentially said, we don't like this name anymore. And uh, public opinion made the Redskins do what they needed to do, what should have been done long ago. But consider if that uh, company would have been owned by the government, uh, like say the government statues. It's, awful. it's a lot harder to get a government to change its ways than it is to get a, a private corporation that has to respond to its, to its, uh, to its customers to change their ways. Hmm. I have a I have a slightly different take on it. Imagine that. Um, and and fortunately, you know, we can offer different opinions. Right right when this uh, the Redskin thing started to get big airplay, and this was uh, this was way before um, the the toppling of Confederate uh, statues and you know people who were supposedly connected with slave holding, holding and Winston Churchill statue and all the rest of that. Um, there was there was a big outcry uh, that the, that the name Redskins uh, was you know demeaning uh, that uh, you know is demeaning to the to the Native American populist populist and um, and they were you know dead set against it and something needed to be done and uh, somebody at that time did did basically an informal poll it wasn't a formal poll uh, or at least I couldn't find it anywhere especially not on Google. Um, uh, amongst Native Americans, I asked them if they cared what the name of the team was, and something like ninety percent of them said, "I don't care." So it wasn't actually the people who were are, are supposedly most hurt by this hateful speech, uh, who believe that the name Redskins is demeaning. It's the people who were um, thought that they were were protecting those people's rights who really brought all the pressure to bear. Um, and, uh, and so I don't know if it was really, you know, a populist message or a bunch of rabble rousers who got it changed. Uh, but the, the fact is that, you know, it was a public marketplace of ideas and, and there weren't enough, you know, people who, who wanted to keep the name Redskins and, you know, is it sort of demeaning? And, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't care. I mean, if they were going to play in the Super Bowl, if they were any good, I might care about what the name of the team was. Like if they were the San Francisco 49ers, you know, or something like that. Well, I think but that's actually the point, John. I think most people I think really they should call care. them the, 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 the Washington um, – let me see. What would what name would, would really bring to life the area of Washington – um, scum, Washington swamp, Washington, crit swamp the, critters. The, the Washington swamp, swamp rat. evil. The Washington like swamp evil. Or crocodiles or something like that. The Washington, the Washington pond scum. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think what you're talking about, John, is a, a, a perfect example of virtue signaling. A lot of people like to what? make themselves virtue signaling. Mm. People like to make themselves feel good by uh, taking uh, a, a stand that they think whoever they're standing up for or whoever they're advocating for would appreciate when the people who they're advocating for could, as you put it, care less. Uh, another good example of that is uh, Spike Cohen uh, talking to uh, blacks when he was door knocking in a black neighborhood and talking about police protect or listening to people, but uh, mentioning police, police brutality and that sort of thing. Turns out they're less concerned about police brutality than they are about occupational licensing laws mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that keep them from getting, a, you know, being able to, uh, pursue their site hustle without getting arrested for uh, violating uh, some sort of uh, work uh, law. Yeah, because that the the and I found that on that uh, that same show, I found that very enlightening. And I've had some conversations with um, 
some people about that very thing. And it was kind of eye opening for them, you know, the fact that 40% of jobs in this country now need some sort of licensing, whereas 25 years ago, I think it was 10%. I mean, it's, it's frightening the increase in, in licensing, which is a barrier to the poor. And then the, you know, there are so many, there are so many crimes that have become felonies uh, that any, any business you want to go into or a job that you want to have, you're prevented from going into it or having it because you've got a felony record and you can't get bonded or licensed or all the rest of that. And I think, uh, I think it's a crying shame. So uh, yeah, it's the, I think the daycare centers uh, in that big building is, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, so I, I absolutely agree. I found that I found that line of reasoning. I'd never really thought about it before because you know people in the in the bottom rung, um, immigrants in this country forever have always uh, really just started at the bottom and ground their way up, um, climbed out of from the bottom by by working harder and longer at at uh, businesses that had ease of entry. You know, that's why restaurants where you'd have people who were high level government officials in China, for example, or, or oligarchs or middle managers who would come here and start restaurants because rather than learn the language and go to school and do all the rest of those things, they would need to have a piece of paper to acquire the same job in the U.S. They started a restaurant and used grandma's recipes and the second generation went to law school or medical school or pharmacy school. But when you put that barrier in the way, people can never climb out because they can't take the traditional route of higher education and, and, and do the licensing because they've got some blemish on their record for having sold cigarettes singly instead of in the carton or something like that, which the government's made illegal. So absolutely right. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to transmit a little bit over to talking about China and Iran. Apparently, there's China and Iran are talking about creating a military alliance. Now, yeah, in fact, uh, it's uh, well along. Uh, they have uh, done, uh, you know, basically, it's, it's a done deal. It only has to be ratified by, I guess, the Iranian uh, legislature, at, at which point, now 25 years of cheap oil in return for China's help with uh, with uh, trade issues and military uh, alliance. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, a situation where the United States making an enemy out of Iran by numerous actions, the most recent of which is canceling the nuclear uh, treaty agreement uh, under the Obama administration, uh, has made an enemy and continues to make an enemy out of Iran. Likewise, Trump is trying his best through trade wars to make an enemy out of China. Uh, we have taken the opportunity to thrust two of our potential allies or potential at least trading partners uh, into each other's arms as allies and enemies. It's actually, uh, it's it's all the way around for the United States. It's a lose, lose, lose situation. Hmm. Well, I don't, and, and again, I, I hate to disagree with Richard. No, actually, I love disagreeing with Richard. Um, should go should for it. some conversations we have on, on long car rides on the way back from hikes or two hikes. Um, I, um, I don't think Iran, the, the, the nuclear deal that they got under the, the Obama, uh, you know, administration, again, you could say a sovereign nation can work on whatever it wants and we have no rights to interfere with it. And I think that would be a kind of a classic liberal or libertarian situation. But, you know, the, our, Iran has, has done some, some pretty crazy things. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, really started, uh, or, or popularize the kind of murder bombers and terrorism and uh, that we see as almost commonplace now. And the idea of them having enriched uranium or plutonium, pretty freaking scary. And the idea of them doing whatever they want with it and, and violating the terms of the agreement they have. And, you know, I mean, China's, China's I think, neck and neck with us for, for being... Uh, a totalitarian state, maybe even maybe even worse, because I don't think they they even have the trappings of a constitution to crush underneath their jackboot. So the two of them together, I think, kind of 
you know, just kind of makes me a little nervous. And, and, you know, if you can say we, we pushed them, we pushed them into it by, by what we're doing, but I think they're natural bedfellows. And, uh, and I, I just, I don't think they needed any pushing from us. They would have got there just fine. Well, I think the Middle East is a natural quagmire and let them do it. Hmm. it we've, I think we've proven that anybody who gets involved in the Middle East it creates its own quagmire and it just sucks the life out of any no, foreign invention. I, I agree. I'm sorry if I, if I sounded like I was, you know, promising. But I actually, well, problems, I think the other side is just they're having an interesting uh, issue with, with India right now. And so with Afghanistan, they've gotten the other, on the other side of India. So I think it's got more to play with India. I don't think it has much to do with us at all. I think it's got more to do with India and on having on that side of the, of the border with India than it's got to do with us. Iran maybe cares about sticking their thumb in our eye, but I don't think it has anything to do with the United States at all. I think it's more China trying to play that China belt thing again. They're just trying to get involved in as many countries as they can. But we saw what happens when communist countries do that. They overextend themselves and they fall apart. So it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, empires have a tendency to expand and then collapse. Uh, and I think Chinese, you know, our empire is in the collapse stage, as it should be. Uh, and I think China is, is in the expansion stage, but they'll get to a point where they uh, have overextended, just like uh, every other empire in, in history has done. Um, the interesting thing about uh, the way China is expanding its empire is that they're largely doing it through uh, peaceful means, through uh, trade, through uh, basically bribing countries to uh, trade with them, to uh, have peaceful relations with them by uh, lending them their expertise and their uh, and their access to their markets. So uh, China's doing a lot of things right in the realm of uh, international relationships. Well, yeah, except they lend these countries money that they know they have no way to pay back. And so in order to pay back, these countries have to give them assets that these countries own, like ports for 100 years and all these kind of deals. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. backhanded devil dog deal, deals. And I, you know, no one in their right mind would sign them except these third world countries that, you know, need the cash to prop up their tin pot dictator. And it's still a better, a, a better, a better approach than going in with a gunship and saying we want your port. This is true. It's better than dropping bombs on people's heads, right? Anything that doesn't yeah, kill I don't, people. I don't think purposes. I don't think the Chinese are guilty of dropping nuclear weapons on on two civilian populaces yet, um, like the the U.S. Empire. Now we're man. I I understand how. Um, I think not not that people you know are really crazy about. Uh, China's records on human rights, or or you know the 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 democratic nature of China, but uh, in the long run, I think uh, uh, the capitalism, which is what they seem to be better at than we are now, is going to make uh, their Communist Party superfluous. So uh, capitalism getting stomped out to the point here where it doesn't have the strength to it. But if I were a second tier country or a third tier country. And I had to look uh, around the world, and there's one hyperpower, and it's one that's got troops in 160 countries, and has demonstrated it's perfectly willing, under the right circumstance, to drop weapons of mass destruction and interfere and topple governments and all the rest of that. I would want some counterbalance, even if it, that counterbalance was evil. Uh, I, I would think, you know, let's have another big boy you know, stick his chest out and bounce chest with the U.S. And it's certainly not going to be us. Yeah, we don't like China, but it's better than having nobody. So I think there, a lot of the world is, uh, is, is pleased that, that China's, uh, you know, uh, what, fighting the bully? Because we've been the bully. We don't see ourselves as the bully, but we certainly have been for an well, awful lot of years. Or at least ha they're happy that there's someone else who can give us a problem if we need to, right? I think, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Maybe a better way. They don't particularly like the bully, but they know there's someone else on the street that we have to worry about kind of theory. Something like that. I don't know. It's a simplistic view, but uh, <laughs> one one hyperpower on the planet is no matter how righteous that hyperpower, that hyperpower thinks it is, is a dangerous thing. Maybe yeah, well, two is more dangerous, but I think I think one's pretty scary. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want there to be to China as the only hyperpower and and the rest of the world certainly doesn't want the U.S. being the only hyperpower, or very few people do. I mean, we think our country, a lot of people think our country is great and democratic and, and, and all the rest of that. But uh, evidence runs counter to that. 
you know, we've we've uh, propped up an awful lot of tin tin pot dictatorships and toppled governments and and uh, you know bribed and coerced and and sent those gunships in. So, what the hell, you know? It's really hard for us to talk about to take the righteous high ground on this one. Yeah. yeah. Well, talk about righteous high ground. Australia is offering ten thousand Hong Kongers a residency. Yeah, uh, that's actually that. the people who from Hong Kong who are uh, in Australia uh, on immigrant uh, visas. They first extended the visa from, I think, three years to five years or something like that. And at the end of that end of the visa, they're saying, uh, if you would like to uh, apply for permanent residency, which gives you the opportunity to uh, apply uh, basically a fast track to citizenship, uh, we're there for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Australia is a country that has relatively... Uh, difficult immigration uh, rules otherwise. So I think Very it's a, a yeah. I think I think it's a good example of Australia doing the right thing. Uh, it's, it's more than virtual sig signaling. It's saying to Hong Kong citizens who are now under the thumb of the uh, uh, of the Chinese government in a whole lot of different ways to say, hey, you don't like it in Hong Kong, you're welcome in Australia. We welcome you. We need you. We value your uh, your talents, and you know, come on over. Uh, oh, if only the United States would have the uh, the moral uh, position to do the same thing. I, I wish I, I wish we would, and I think um, the we've seen the the benefits to. I don't know if you've been to Vancouver lately and looked at uh, housing prices there, and looked at the the demographic makeup of their of their uh, populace. But, you know, basically the Canadian governments had, had sort of a deal going where, you know, you bring your, you bring some capital in, you can basically buy citizenship in, in Canada. And um, it's, they've gotten wealthy, highly educated, productive people out of China and into Vancouver, especially. And I think the, the Vancouver, Population is like 40% Asian. I'd have to double check. It could be radically wrong because I didn't look it up before. I think we would, we would, the, the, the United Kingdom is saying 3 million Hong Kong residents uh, if they have the, the right kind of older passport. Because right when this happened, they, they gave in 97, they gave a bunch of people the option of having kind of an open door passport, where, which would allow them the process to get a UK passport. Um, and they're opening up to as many as 3 million people. And, you know, the best and the brightest are going to want to leave. And uh, the best and the brightest are the hardest working have always come, come to this country. And that's what's made it a wonderful country. So I agree with Richard, I think. Shocker, I agree with Richard. I think we uh, should should uh, say, and I'd love to see uh, the Trumpeter, Trump tweeter, uh, Trump tweeter, um, Say you know I'm I'm not a, a big fan of uh, of uh, undocumented people coming, but there's there's wonderful thrifty hardworking democratic people in this country, and they might be looking for a home. and And I why don't we open our arms to these people? I don't think it's going to happen, uh, but I'd love to see that. I think that would be great. I agree with Richard. Yeah, did the, Richard, maybe you know, did the UK offer uh, Hong Kongers uh, residency yeah. or something? Yeah. I thought I'd heard something about that. Three million. Yeah. Up to three million. Up to three million. Yeah, yeah. yeah the UK is the one who threw them under the bus. So you know that was kind of a. Well, yes and no. I mean, they they didn't have much they, choice. They, they had the uh, Britain had a a lease on that piece of property that ended in 1997, and they had really really no choice but to give Hong Kong back to China because it was China's territory in the first place. So they were kind of in a position where they had to negotiate the best exit plan possible. And it worked for 20 years, uh, give or take. Uh, yeah. Hong Kong was a bastion of free enterprise, productivity, capitalist uh, success. Um, and, Low and crime. It was, and it was, yeah. yeah, very little crime. And it was also China's gateway to the Western world in, for, for a very long time. Now that China itself has become more capitalistic, they don't really need Hong Kong as an as a uh, as a, uh, a way stop anymore. So I think that's part of the reason that they have clamped down. And the other thing about China, of course, is although they may be capitalistic, they're extremely uh, uh, 
uh, fascistic or, or communistic, I guess is the right word, in their treatment of free speech. They don't allow it, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I, I, I was talking to somebody, uh, a Chinese um, immigrant, the other day, and it says, you can be perfectly fine in China as long as you keep your head down and keep your mouth shut about politics. You can, yep, you, can yep, succeed, yep. You, can be, you can be successful, you can do anything you want to do, as long as you just shut up about politics. It says, as long as you don't talk about politics, you can be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Then, so it's, 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 a, it's a, an economy built on business and uh, uh, trust that the, uh, the communist dictatorship will uh, continue to make business uh, easy to do. Uh, that's, of mm -hmm. course, I, I, I trust is probably misplaced in the long run, but in the short run, it's working just fine. Yeah, I just don't say anything bad about the party and uh, and the party or the whichever dictators in charge. I don't, I don't really. Communist is probably the wrong description for them, even though they say they're the Chinese Communist Party because they're yeah, they're, 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 they're less yeah. communist than we are. I mean, I've traveled in China on a couple of different occasions, and uh, the guides who have to be members of the, of the Chinese Communist Party in order to get a guide job. You have to be a member of the party. Mm -hmm. I get them uh, in, you know, behind closed doors in private and they'll talk about uh, these things and say, yeah, I'm a member of the party. I have no choice. Uh, but, you know, hey, we just do our thing. Do our thing. Keep your head down. Don't say anything. Yeah. Which is kind of cancel culture at its worst uh, or most powerful. <laughs> well, sure. Well, uh, you yeah. know, it, to the nth degree. So I guess when when uh, when we're talking to to our our, our liberal, let's you know, our our progressive and progressive is wrong because it's not progress. It's going back to the to the star chamber. It's not even leftist. Yeah, it's really it's uh, it's well, I don't it's know Marxist. what it is. woke Marxist. To, Marxist. woke totalitarian. Marxist. This is call it Marxist. That's what it is. Yeah, Marxist is closest to it. And when we're talking to them, let's just talk about. Uh, the the biggest baddest example of cancel culture is communist China, but the what they're proposing economically wouldn't have any of the benefits. So as you have the worst of communist China, with the worst of Venezuela put together, and that's what they want for this country. So those are the two comparison countries for us when we're having conversations with them. Yeah, here in the United States, you know, keeping your head down and shutting up about politics is kind of counterintuitive. We don't do it, except essentially that's what counterculture is. They want you to sit down, shut up, and not talk about politics unless you're going to repeat their words, right? If we go back to the, the beginning yeah. of counterculture, that's what it is. You you can't say anything unless you say our words, but silence is now violence, so you must say our words, otherwise you're committing an act of violence. And hmm. so we... <laughs> and, which, of course, you know, if, you, if you're committing an act We're of violence... We're in charge, don't you forget it. Yeah, if you commit an act of violence, that means I can now commit an act of violence to defend myself, even though you all you did was not say anything. And mm -hmm. you created this whole culture of where we've got, I don't even know where it's going. Hopefully, it's starting to turn around. And that's about all the time we have. Thank everybody for watching. You can find all of our information about what we talked about at libertariancounterpoint.com. You can look for us on all the social media, various things at Libertarian Counterpoint. If you catch us on YouTube, please hit the like button. Gail likes that when you do. And from all of us, thank you for watching. And please remember to love everybody. Well, thank you for the opportunity. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.